So thank you very much for inviting us to present this paper. This is a bit of a Wharton reunion. Uh, uh, so uh, this paper is uh, joined uh, with uh, Winston Doe uh, from uh, Wharton and uh, Weibo from Texas A&M, Common Fund Flows for Hedging and Factor Pricing. And um, uh, to motivate uh, this project, uh, we can start thinking about uh, the, the traditional dynamic asset pricing models and what assumptions go into them. So a lot of models uh, follow the general framework of uh, ICAPM, and they essentially neoclassic constitution free models and the households are marginal investors. And uh, the problem with this framework, the limitation is that it does place a significant uh, burden on households in terms of information processing and uh, being able to form expectations about the dynamics and also build these uh, dynamic optimal plans. Uh, so that's also a source of skepticism that uh, I guess many in the profession have about the conclusions of these models that really assume households to be uh, super powerful in terms of being rational and being able to compute things. Uh, that is the limitation. And um, in reality, of course, uh, households uh, may not be the marginal prices in different markets. Uh, they may not engage uh, so much in security selection. Uh, there are institutions that are playing an important uh, role in the markets and they're excluded from these models. And the institutions, uh, of course, we can model them, but they have different objectives from households. And so what uh, our focus here is uh, on understanding how this difference in objectives may play out in terms of pricing implications and to what extent we can retain uh, some of the pricing results that we like about macroeconomic shocks being priced in the cross-section of returns uh, in an environment where households don't need to be super sophisticated and may behave in a relatively simplistic manner and it falls on institutions. Uh, to act as marginal pricers and uh, to create pricing relations between risk and return in the market. So that's kind of a general theoretical motivation maybe, but what we actually do is um, we focus um, on the behavior of uh, active uh, mutual fund managers. And uh, as uh, Rob already summarized and uh, his overview, we made the first observation is that uh, fund managers to the extent that they care about their AUM, that because their fees are related to their AUM, uh, AUM is driven by returns that uh, their portfolio generates, but also by flows in and out of the fund. And uh, these flows can be substantial and uh, they can affect uh, AUM quantitatively as much as returns. So if you look at the uh, variance of uh, changes in AUM and you think about how much uh, is um, coming from returns and how much is coming from uh, flows. Uh, flows are a substantial piece. So they're economically meaningful. So our goal here is to understand both theoretically and empirically uh, hedging behavior of uh, fund managers. Do they care about these flows? Can we see a reveal preference that they are tilting their portfolios to control flow risk? And uh, we want to uh, show the implications of this kind of flow hedging behavior for asset pricing. And uh, in particular, we want to see to what extent an icapm like relation emerges where non-market aggregate shocks may be priced in an environment that uh, is essentially myopic, where there is no intertemporal hedging. Uh, as Rob mentioned, is this an efficient way to deal with flow risk? No, it wouldn't be, uh, but uh, we're not trying to figure out efficient contracts. This does look um, like an agency problem and uh, it seems to be costly to investors because managers are not doing exactly what investors would want, just like firm managers are not doing exactly what uh, shareholders would want. But we take this agency problem as given. We're not trying to figure out an efficient contract. That is basically a different line of inquiry, which also seems like it would be interesting to pursue. So what we find is the following. Empirical, we find that uh, fund flow shocks have a strong factor structure that is an important common component. And this common component uh, comes with some macroeconomic states. So for example, it comes with the economic uncertainty, aggregate uncertainty. So it connects macroeconomic shocks uh, with fund flows and ultimately with asset prices. Uh, we find that the flow beta is uh, priced in the cross section of stock returns. Uh, uh, what that means is that stocks with the high flow beta have relatively high expected returns. And uh, this uh, appears to be a compensated risk factor, which is analogous to the ICAPM intertemporal hedging term without actual intertemporal hedging 
in the model. So in the data, we see that these flow betas do predict returns in the cross-section of stocks, and we control for some characteristics to see to what extent. This is a separate phenomenon from what we already know. Uh, what's important here is that uh, we don't just look at the implications for returns, but we also look directly at the holdings of managers uh, so that we can get a better feel for whether or not the mechanism is actually there in the data. So we look at the portfolio uh, holdings of the managers, we look at the tilts in their portfolios relative to market weights. And what we see is that uh, in the aggregate, uh, these active fund managers, they tend to tilt away from high flow beta stocks. This tilt is costing them and their investors uh, expected returns. So they are uh, underperforming relative to what they could have done if they didn't tilt. And uh, we find that the magnitude of the tilt uh, changes with the amount of outflow risk. So when uh, managers are facing more of this flow risk, aggregate flow risk, they're tilting more. And uh, we are finding these results, uh, not just in the cross section of funds, but also we look at uh, time variation in the tilt and some quasi natural experiments. So we could sort of control for the fund characteristics and look at uh, a cleaner kind of time variation in the incentive to tilt and the portfolio tilt itself. So many people worked on the related literature. There is no way I can discuss that here. Let me introduce the model and some empirical results. The model is an equilibrium model with a relatively simple structure. Some of the elements of the model are essential for the results. Some are there because we need to complete the model to get to the equilibrium. And uh, those secondary elements could be rewritten in many different ways, preserving the main conclusions. So what are the main elements of the model? We assume that everyone in this environment is myopic. This is not because we believe that everyone in the market is myopic, but uh, pedagogical, this is kind of nice to make the point that this is not about intertemporal hedging. In particular, we have three types of uh, actors here. We have uh, direct investors who measure their own portfolios. We have fund clients. These are investors who in equilibrium delegate their portfolios to the active fund managers. And then we have fund managers themselves who care only about their AUM and don't care about welfare of their investors. So they behave as a, a good economic agent, sure, completely selfish. So now what we find uh, in the model is that uh, there is endogenous fund flow that responds, responds to aggregate shocks. And we also find that these funds have endogenous alphas in equilibrium. These are secondary results, they're not uh, critical for getting the main conclusion about hedging, but they actually go against the main results. So it's kind of interesting to see that we can get these uh, patterns that are empirically realistic and that they preserve the main results. So basically we find that uh, fund alphas, net alphas are counter cyclical and the fund flows are pro cyclical. And uh, as I said before, this uh, link is really central. The link between macro shocks and asset prices that goes through the fund flows. Basically, funds don't care about their investors directly, only through the flow. So they wouldn't care about macro shocks that affect their investors, but they do respond to the fund flows. And this is why macroeconomic shocks that may be important for households in terms of inducing them to move their money in and out of the mutual fund sector, these shocks will eventually make their way into risk premium and into asset prices. All right, now let me describe some of the structure of the model. If you don't follow all these equations, which I don't expect you to do in real time, it's fine. Uh, basically, uh, qualitatively, in terms of the moving pieces, it's a fairly simple setting. So basically, we have an endowment economy, uh, a large number of uh, risky assets, and a finite small number of common factors. So it's kind of like an APT factor structure. And what's highlighted here is this uh, vector U. These are aggregate shocks that are common to all of these securities in the market. And uh, in particular, there is uh, one state variable here, uh, H. Uh, H uh, drives the volatility of these uh, cash flow shocks. Um, for the sake of the argument, this is enough for us to have a single state variable. Of course, that's not supposed to be a realistic description. Uh, in the data, we would expect to see multiple aggregate shocks that matter. But here, it's all about this uncertainty shock, U, that uh, changes volatility of all the dividends uh, at the same time. Now. What uh, this implies is that uh, in equilibrium, uh, stock returns uh, are going to load up uh, on the same common shocks, not surprisingly, on the common shocks here. And uh, the state variable that drives uh, aggregate uncertainty shows up 
also in the cross-section of returns as the common component of uh, return risk. Now, the agents in our model, as I said, are myopic and the way we model them is through an old G structure where each agent lives for one period and uh, they don't care about their descendants. So they're myopic in their behavior. And on top of that, we make some additional assumptions to make sure that wealth gets redistributed uh, after each period. So we don't need to keep track of the time varying persistent uh, uh, dynamics of wealth, which would be kind of irrelevant for the conclusions, but would add state variables. So each uh, generation is uh, born at MT, uh, has uh, three different types. They have fund managers, fund clients, and direct investors. And managers have no wealth. They just uh, manage funds and they uh, consume their fees. And uh, fund clients and investors, they split the wealth in the economy. So fund clients have fraction lambda and um, they uh, choose how much to delegate to the funds. In equilibrium, they delegate everything in terms of risky assets to the funds. And direct investors, they're born with one minus lambda. They don't delegate anything. They manage their own portfolios. So these direct investors uh, optimize a one period objective. We log linearize everything for tractability. But uh, that implies is that uh, everyone is basically mean variance optimized as the all myopic. Uh, they don't care about high order moments because of this approximation. Uh, direct investors maximize their mean variance objective. Uh, they have a unit elasticity of substitution, so consumption policy is very simple. And uh, one thing to assume is that uh, these direct investors, they um, uh, lose something, uh, they lose this kind of alpha that is collected by the active managers. We don't model exactly how alpha is generated. It's a reduced form assumption that active managers are able to extract some value relative to households to manage their portfolio directly. So in equilibrium, what's important here is that the mean variance optimizers and they're going to have uh, efficient portfolios. They're going to hold mean variance efficient portfolios. So these are direct investors. Mutual funds. Uh, mutual funds, uh, as I said, they maximize um, utility of the fees they collect, which are proportional to the AUM. They control uh, amount of funds Q in equilibrium. That's the total value of the funds. Uh, it's endogenous. Uh, they uh, are adding some value, which we model in reduced form as being proportional. To Q, this is the gross alpha, and uh, they incur some fees, some costs rather, of managing uh, their funds, of generating this alpha, and we model these costs as is common, uh, as a convex function of the size uh, of um, uh, of their capital, and uh, we could do it at the fund level or at the whole industry level. Um, all the funds in the model are the same, so it doesn't matter, and. Uh, they charge a constant fee to the investors, which again is a reduced form assumption, it's not an optimal contract, which is proportional to AUM. So the net result is a pretty standard construction for this literature that net alpha is decreasing in the overall size of the uh, active mutual fund sector. So the smaller the fund sector, the larger the alpha they can generate. So in equilibrium, both the alpha and the amount of delegated funds are determined. So Here's the delegation decision. These uh, fund clients are myopic. Uh, they don't even need to have rational expectations about what funds do. That's not important. And we don't even assume that. They essentially, they, focus, they do focus on the alpha. So they uh, do decide how much to delegate uh, a part in relation to the alpha. But to really simplify this, we assume that they just derive utility from delegation. They just like delegating. So that in equilibrium, we don't need to solve for what fraction of their wealth they delegate. They delegate everything. They uh, allocate between the risk-free asset and the risky assets on their own, but the risky portfolio, they delegate the whole thing. You could justify it by appealing to some kind of money doctor's idea, but that's really why that assumption is there to simplify the derivation. What is really critical is that the amount that these guys delegate uh, is, um, the amount that they delegate is declining uh, in the aggregate uncertainty of the economy. So that's important. And it also is increasing in the alpha. And so in equilibrium, the amount delegated and the net alpha determined jointly. And what we find is that net alpha is counter-cyclical and the amount of funds delegated is pro-cyclical. And then when we look at the flows, in particular, we are going to care eventually about the flow shock, the unexpected component of fund flows into the mutual fund sector. Uh, that component uh, loads up on the aggregate uncertainty shocks 
um, negatively. So when uncertainty rises, money flows out of the mutual fund sector. So that is going to connect uncertainty shocks to pricing in the markets here. All right, as I already said, mutual fund managers consume their fees. They also live for one period. They derive fees from both periods. And um, because of that, they're going to solve a mean, mean variance problem where the objective is not over returns, but rather over the change in AUM, which has a flow piece. And that means that fund managers do not hold uh, a mean variance efficient portfolio. They're going to deviate, they're going to tilt in order to hedge to some degree the flow risk. And in equilibrium, that implies that if you look at the portfolio weight of the fund managers, which is little m, uh, they deviate from the mean variance efficient portfolio in the direction of this tilt. The tilt is related to the betas of individual stocks on the flows. And um, we can uh, show that in equilibrium, if you look at the cross-sectional covariance between the portfolio tilt of the managers relative to the market, right, the deviation of their weight in the security from the market weight, and the flow bait of the security, that covariance is negative. So these managers, they downweigh high beta stocks, overweigh low beta stocks, with the, with, where the betas are betas on aggregate flows. Of course, not surprisingly, we end up with a two-factor pricing model. We only have basically two aggregate shocks here. So there is market is going to be inefficient here in a mean variance sense. Uh, it's going to deviate from the tangent portfolio. And uh, the deviation is in the direction of this flow beta tilt. So in equilibrium, risk premium on all the stocks are going to be based on a two-factor structure. There is a market exposure that's priced, that's the first term. And there is going to be covariance with the flows that is priced, and that's the second term. All right, so now let me talk about empirical results. The data we use is standard, basically a standard collection of data on mutual fund holdings uh, from Thompson and Crisp and also uh, their assets under management um, and, and characteristics from Crisp and Morningstar. And we are only looking at the US active mutual funds. We don't look at international funds. We don't look at passive funds. Although passive funds are kind of interesting because flows into passive funds don't have the same properties and they are not priced the same way as flows into active funds are, which is indirectly consistent uh, with our model. But it's basically a non-result, which you would hope to get. We also have data that we need for some quasi-nature experiments. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the um, trade war, but uh, for the natural disasters, we look at the data on natural disasters, the geographic distribution of disasters. So we could um, connect disaster data with the firms. All right. So for the common fund flow, Uh, for the common fund flow, we look at the fund flow first at the fund level, and uh, we extract a common component, theta. Uh, we have some controls for the fund performance to absorb some of the variation of flows that is predictable by past and current performance of the fund itself relative to the market. And this theta represents the common component which we're after. Epsilon is fund-specific uh, unpredictable part. So now we define the common uh, we define the fund flow shock as this common component plus epsilon. And then we aggregate funds into different groups based on characteristics like size and age. And what we observe is that flows that these different groups experience, they are different, but they have a lot in common with each other. So there is clearly, if you look at it just eyeballing it, there is a common component there, a common factor. Uh, that drives uh, flows into different groups of funds, non-developing groups. And uh, you could uh, sort funds on a variety of characteristics. You get kind of similar results. It's sort of like if you sort stocks on size, you could get common component coming from the market. And uh, what we then do is extract uh, uh, principal components uh, from this cross-section of funds, from these buckets of funds. And what you see from these graphs is that the uh, first principal component does explain a lot of uh, variation in the flows. So we take this uh, leading PC as our definition of the systematic or common component of flows. All right, so this definition is robust to some of these other choices that one would make in terms of how you define the universe of fund. Chris, Monistar, intersection, or Chris alone. Uh, do you do it by asset size, do you do it by age? So I'm not gonna talk much about using CRISP versus the intersection, 
The all results are pretty similar in the sense that they go through. All right, so now here's the baseline result that a flow risk is priced. So if you sort stocks on their fund flow beta or you run a cross-sectional regression, you see that there is a correlation between betas and uh, risk premium on the stocks. And these are significant. And uh, CAPM doesn't absorb this. So if you control for the market exposure, it doesn't uh, absorb that. You have CAPM alphas and that there is a significant difference between funds with high versus low exposures to the aggregate flows. Uh, this uh, graph just shows you visually what uh, the table was saying. This is a post-formation returns. And you could see that once you allocate stocks into different portfolios, their returns are different for at least the next year in terms of expected returns. So we are sorting here on a very simple definition of the fund flow beta. It's a, a non-parametric estimate based on monthly returns of a three-year backward looking window. And uh, in this table, we see post-formation betas just to confirm that when we sort on the past betas, we're actually predicting differences in future betas, which we are. So these uh, portfolios are forming that do have different fund flows betas and they have different expected returns. So that's a baseline result. By itself, it could mean many different things, but it does say that uh, betas on the fund flows are correlated with the uh, future returns. We also want to confirm that funds actually behave in terms of their portfolio formation, the way that the model predicts. Now, this is a family of Beth regression. Instead of sorting into portfolios, we just run a cross-sectional regression. Uh, this way, we could also control for other characteristics. And I say control, this is not because we need to somehow distinguish uh, weight on flows from some stock characteristics. Our theory doesn't say anything about how characteristics are related to the betas. This is just a way of summarizing the data to learn more about the properties. Like, for example, um, is this pattern different from just sorting a book to market or sorting on size or liquidity? And so the answer is yes, it is distinct from sorting stocks on these common characteristics. Not that the theory tells us it should be distinct. It could have been exactly the same and maybe this is an explanation for some of these characteristics predicting the chance, but it's not. It's to some degree an explanation, but it's not the same thing. All right, so we have that. Now let's look at the uh, fund behavior. So one thing that we do is we look at the deviation of the fund holdings. This is across the entire universe of active funds, deviations of the holdings of different assets from the market weights. And what we find in this table is that if you run a cross-sectional regression, um, well, this is actually a panel, but uh, think of the cross-sectional regression of um, fund um, holdings uh, of different assets, how they deviate from the market on the flow beta of the stock and the market beta. What uh, we care about is the flow beta. You see that they actually um, uh, underway high beta stocks, which is uh, good because that's what the theory is telling us they should be doing in the aggregate. Now, of course, it's possible that there are some unobservable from characteristics that simultaneously predict returns and predict these uh, beta. So that, that could be, but um, notice that they're not chasing returns. They are underweighting stocks that have relatively high risk premium, right? So they are underweighting high beta stocks. So if they were just going for the expected returns, they would be doing the opposite. So th this is hurting their performance. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, flow betas are related to some common from characteristics. Uh, in particular, if you look at uh, things like book to market, liquidity measures, size, they're related to all these things. Uh, and uh, in particular, what you find is uh, basically uh, it's value stocks that have higher flow betas. Uh, it's um, stocks with high liquidity risk and illiquid stocks that have high flow betas. Now liquidity in particular is uh, kind of interesting to think about because uh, I'm kind of going with uh, Rob's narrative here, which we thought about this one. This is kind of problematic potentially that if a stock is illiquid, it's possible that its price gets pushed around more by the aggregate flows. It's conceivable. It's not in the model, but it's quite believable. So an illiquid stock may have high flow beta in the data that's actually true. It may also have high expected returns on paper at least because it's illiquid. And then it's gonna have basically this thing that it's illiquidity that uh, is predicting returns. And it just happens to be correlated with the flow beta. So something like illiquidity is important to control for, which we do. And it doesn't absorb the explanatory power of the flow betas but it does predict returns uh, directly on its own. 
All right. Uh, the other thing that uh, we did was uh, we looked at the portfolio tilts of um, uh, these uh, mutual funds in relation to firm characteristics. And this is a bit of a sideline. It's related to an interesting point that Sydney and co-authors made that these mutual funds don't seem to be exploiting book to market, for example, the standard quant tilts. They could have done it, but they don't seem to be doing it. They're tilting the other way, if anything. What does that mean, right? So why are they avoiding the tilt? Could be for a variety of reasons. But um, what we found is actually, if you control for the predicted flow beta, which is correlated with book to market, this kind of opposite tilt towards growth, it does disappear in the aggregate. And if you look at the fund level, it actually flips signs. So if you just look at the tilt at the fund level, it's an average against value stocks. But if you control for the flow betas, for the predicted betas, it uh, goes uh, uh, in, in the direction of value stocks away from growth. So it's kind of interesting that um, understanding how funds tilt on flow beta can help in other dimensions, kind of some related questions about their portfolio structure. Now, let me tell you about these quasi natural experiments. Um, so here, uh, we look at a particular experiment, which is natural disasters. And uh, what we find is that funds that are affected by natural disasters, meaning that a significant fraction of their portfolio uh, happens to have this property that firms are headquartered or have lots of establishments in the areas hit by disasters, these funds uh, are facing higher outflow risk going forward. So that is a starting point. So that kind of tells you that natural disasters, which are arguably exogenous to the fund, uh, they do shift uh, their exposure to outflow risk. So that's good. And uh, that uh, partly helps us address this kind of indigeneity issue that uh, yes, outflow risk uh, and uh, uh, tilts are related, but maybe there is a common factor that drives both and we really don't know what it is. So it's a vague kind of uh, argument, but uh, there's always that kind of concern. So in this setting, at least the disasters are exogenous and uh, are not uh, affected by the fund's own behavior. So there is no reverse causality. So we create this uh, disaster variable, which uh, tells us what uh, fraction of the fund value is uh, affected by the disasters based on the headquarter locations of the companies in the portfolio. And uh, these are idiosyncratic and exogenous. Um, and uh, we focus on the fund's response in terms of the portfolio composition on the portion of the portfolio not affected by the natural disasters. And um, what we see is that uh, uh, funds that are affected by natural disasters, they do face higher outflow risk in the subsequent periods, which uh, is uh, kind of in line with this design that a natural disaster shock hits the fund and changes its uh, exposure to outflow risk. So this uh, following table basically confirms that funds affected by natural disasters experience not only higher expected outflow, but also higher risk of outflows measured in a variety of ways by dispersion of flows, by the, uh, how heavy the left tail is. So these funds are facing more risk. And then we look for the rebalancing of the stocks that are not directly affected by disasters. The reason why we're looking at the not affected stocks is that we obviously don't want to be in a situation where firm fundamentals are affected by the disaster shock, and that's why they're rebalancing. We want to have a somewhat credible story that they're rebalancing because of what the risk that the fund is facing, not because of the properties of the stock itself. And so what we found is that funds do rebalance the unaffected portion of their portfolio. They do rebalance away from the high beta stocks. And uh, this is the interaction term with the natural disasters, that when the disaster hits, they change their portfolio composition. And uh, you could uh, have a fund fixed effect. So then we have an average tilt. This is the increase in the tilt, following the increased risk of outflows. And uh, we find that this uh, increased tilt is costly to them in a sense that if the, uh, they didn't do it, the way we model it is we basically freeze their portfolio composition uh, before uh, they uh, rebalance their portfolio. And we say, what would have happened if they didn't rebalance? Uh, we find that that uh, reduces their performance. On average, fund rebalancing is actually good uh, for the performance. But this kind of rebalancing they do in response to natural disaster shocks lowers their returns anywhere from 60 to 100 basis points annualized. So that tells us that 
at least uh, there is no simple explanation that uh, they found a way to chase returns. So that's what you're getting. They're moving against uh, their performance in expectation. They're tilting away from the flow risk at a cost in terms of performance. All right, to conclude, uh, what we found is uh, on the empirical side that uh, there is a common component of fund flows. It is priced in the cross-section of stocks and mutual funds appear to be hedging exposure to the flow risk. On the theoretical side, we show that uh, this kind of behavior by the funds implies that some aggregate shocks that drive flows end up being priced in the cross-section of returns in a way that is similar to the ICAPM pricing relation without the I term. This is a myopic environment where nobody is trying to hedge intertemporally. Uh, there is a simple hedging of the mutual funds intratemporally against fund flows, which significantly reduces the burden on households in terms of decision-making in these models and creates uh, what we think is an interesting link between basically the macro shocks that affect myopic households and institutional decision-making and ultimately asset prices. That's Great. It. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lenny. That was a great presentation and right on time. So um, this piece, uh, please keep uh, posting in the chat too. We will get to the chat uh, questions and comments after the discussion. So uh, please keep doing that. Now we're ready for our discussant, however, and that's uh, Sydney Ludvigsen from uh, NYU. So Sydney, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Great. Um, Hi, everyone. I really enjoyed uh, reading this paper. It took me out of my uh, range of things that I've been thinking about lately. It's an interesting read. So I think this paper makes um, several contributions on the empirical side. It shows that mutual fund flows obey a factor structure and are priced in the cross section of individual stock returns. That's a cool result. Fund flows respond to macro shocks. Cool again. Portfolios of active mutual funds are tilted towards low fund betas. You know, that's interesting and makes a lot of sense given their fee structure. Um, and then on the theoretical side, they show that there's one way that you can get all this in general equilibrium. Um, I think that's a feat in and of itself. And then they get an endogenous pro-cyclical flow, uh, mutual fund flow and counter-cyclical net alpha, um, which in turn are driven in their model by exogenous macro shocks. So bottom line, I think these results uh, should be of interest to the profession and they're worth exploring further. So I'm going to make comments first on the empirical part and questions and then on the theory, just a couple on the theoretical part. So on the empirical part, the outline is at first I want to ask more about the primitive economic shocks that drive these common fund flows. Um, second, I had some questions about the flow betas versus the betas for economic fundamentals and the pricing of stock returns. Third, I just had a question about equity characteristic anomaly portfolio returns and, and their relation possibly to these common fund flows. Okay, so first on the primitive shocks. Um, I, I just think it's a very interesting question, especially given how important mutual funds you know, and, and pension funds, as the authors mentioned at the beginning of their paper, are as asset owners in the equity space to understand what's really driving these flows. And, you know, the authors point out that there are some uncertainty shocks or proxies for uncertainty that are correlated with these flows. And that's certainly interesting. And I, I completely buy that these may be driving some of the flows. But I also look at those correlations and think, well, they're low enough that other shocks uh, must be playing a role. And so, one question is, I think, for future research is just to think more about like which shocks are really driving around, what types of shocks are really moving around these fund flows. You know, you can imagine that something, let's just call it beliefs or sentiment, intangible information, something that moves around the willingness to tolerate risk um, independently of sort of the aggregate economic state might be driving a lot of it. Um, you know, the authors mentioned this paper by Pastor and Borstas. Borstas uh, Borsas, uh, you know, which is showing that fund outflows really uh, increased dramatically during the COVID-19 market crash. So this is something that by itself, that these funds are really important in the equity space, which just drive up equity volatility. Um, and so there's a causality question there that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, and, you know, um, Gormson and Cohen, and then we have a recent paper where we tried to understand this V-shaped trajectory um, from March to April of 2020. And you know, bo both 
papers concluded that it's really driven by plot, most plausibly by wild fluctuations in the pricing of stock market risk um, rather than uh, sort of the quantity of risk. Now, some of that may be correlated with the COVID uncertainty shock, but you know, for example, what we did is we did a, um, an announcement effect of the Fed announcements about credit facilities and found that they played an important role in the turnabout. But there was very little credit actually extended by these facilities as of July uh, 31st. And this just suggests that the, the substance was less important than the sentiment that was created by these, uh, or that's at least one interpretation than the sentiment created by these um, these announcements, taking us back to a potential role for um, belief, sentiment, and tangible information, what, whatever you want to label it. Um, admittedly harder to measure. <clears throat> but, and then there's the question of causality. So one could ask, uh, given the observation in the second bullet, does uncertainty cause fund flows or the other way around? Um, uh, you know, uh, the volatility, if they're holding 44% of the equity market, the volatility and flows should by themselves, if they're moving around for some reasons such as sentiment cause stock market volatility. So that's gonna have the reverse causality uh, implication for measures that like, the authors use in their paper, like the VIX, the VXO, even, even the EPU, which is driven by um, newspaper articles that are bound to pick up on the words uncertainty uh, when the stock market volatility is high. So, you know, macroeconomic uncertainty that's tied to macroeconomic variables, that to me seems less obviously endogenous to fund flows. So I, I would have <clears throat> liked to look at macroeconomic uncertainty. So yeah, I'm sort of partial to my own measures of uncertainty. So the authors kindly provided their common fund flows and I threw it into a three variable structural vector auto regression using um, one of our, with Kyle Gerardo and Serena Eng, our measure of macro uncertainty. We also have a measure of financial uncertainty now. That one turns out to be fairly highly correlated with the, the VIX um, over the common sample, like 0.85, um, but it does have some independent variation. And then uh, we put in the common fund flows, I'll use CFF for common fund flows. And we identify this three variable structural VAR using uh, some assumptions that we use in this, this paper here. Um, it, event and external variable constraints um, you know, without the usual exogeneity assumption. So external variables think external IV, but unlike an external IV, you don't need to assume that that um, IV is correlated with some shocks and not others. Um, the cost of that is you get these sets of um, solutions. And so that's what these are. These are actually sets of, of impulse responses. But nevertheless, the bounds of these um, identified sets can be narrow enough to tell you something. And so all I wanted to point out here is that if you look at, we've got three variables and three shocks, we can plot out the effect of uh, each of these variables to each shock. And if you look at what's happening to common fund flows in response to a financial uncertainty shock, this would be very similar if I put the VIX in here, it doesn't seem to be causing fund outflows. In fact, you get sort of this indeterminate result that it causes you know, both positive and negative responses here, but mostly it just hovers around zero. Now, if you look at shocks to common fund flows, well, those do cause financial uncertainty uh, with a positive sign now. So like inflows, which is what you're seeing here, a big shock, um, this, is, this is the normalized, they normalize their common fund flow factor so that an increase means uh, an increase on average and in, in, uh, inflows, you see that this drives up financial uncertainty. So where is this negative correlation that they document coming from? Well, it's, it's coming from um, the fact that high macro uncertainty, which is not core, you know, mutually uncorrelated with these other two sources of variation does cause fund outflows. And that's what you, you see here, right? So a big decline in fund outflows and high macro uncertainty also drives up financial uncertainty. And that's what you see here. And so the channel is operating through macro uncertainty. I actually like this result even better than what they have in their paper now because macro uncertainty just seems uh, less, less obviously endogenous. Okay, question two. What is, so I was trying to think about the marginal ro role of fund flow betas versus primitive betas. So in the model, the equilibrium asset under management and some uncertainty shock or whatever other primitive shocks that you would put in there would seem to be perfectly correlated. So modulo some nonlinearities and in the model, I would have thought that the flow betas and the primitive betas should drive each other out in these cross-sectional asset pricing regressions of you know, average returns on betas. 
and I put wrong here because I'm not entirely sure what the answer to this is, but that was my thinking about this model. So in reality, of course, there's primitives other than uncertainty. We were just talking about perhaps sentiment probably playing a role in which case an extended version of their model um, in which they had more than one sort of state variable, the flow betas and the uncertainty betas would seem to me to be both priced. Um, is that wrong? I, I'm not sure. I think it would be useful to simulate the model and run these regressions so that we can exactly trace out what the model's relationship is to the specific regressions that have been run in the data. So now to do the second one, you obviously need to augment the model to allow for at least two mutually orthogonal primitive shocks. In the data, if you look at their table five, the flow betas drive out the primitive betas, um, at least the uncertainty betas. So um, that seems un inconsistent with either one or my interpretation, either one or two. And number one, you take the model literally, there's just uncertainty shocks. Um, uncertainty and the common flow betas should then drag each other out. And, and number two, that's obviously more realistic, then both betas should be significant because I take the spirit of the model's fundamental story to be whatever reason for these common fund flows, the mutual funds are trying to hedge against it. Um, it was just unclear to me why the flow betas only were significant and the uncertainty betas were driven out. Um, I just think it would be helpful to see some simulations to address uh, what, what is the role of the marginal role of these different exposures um, in their model and how that relates to the empirical results. Okay, question three on the empirical side. Um, so is the cross-section of returns on these, you know, well-known characteristic anomaly portfolios explained by common fund flows? So Lynn had pointed out, um, you know, it's sort of a puzzle that, you know, I've done a little bit of work with, um, Martin let down Paolo Manuel. And you know, there's these mutual funds don't seem to tilt towards the profitable return factors like book to market and others that you, you might expect. And so that's potentially consistent with their model. Um, they have shown also that the common flow beta and the book to market ratio are perfectly correlated um, with one another. So, you know, funds have an incentive to tilt towards value stocks after controlling for, for the flow beta. So this doesn't really address the exact question of whether the common fund flow exposure helps explain, for example, the value premium, um, or more generally, how much of the cross-section of these equity characteristic portfolio returns do um, these flows explain. So this is just something, uh, they sent us the data. We, I, you know, actually a student did this. Uh, we just poked around a little bit. I'm not even sure if this is the most informative thing to do, but you know, we asked, well, how much of the cross-section of returns on a, a few different equity characteristic anomaly portfolios are explained by the flow beta. Um, we just did a form of Beth regression. We looked at these size book to market, size investment, size operating procedure, um, re, um, based on revenue, uh, reversal, excuse me, and just the total of those. And these are just portfolios that we can download from Ken French's uh, website. But, so what you see is that the, the, these are the factor risk prices and some T stats, Shank can correct it. Greater exposure to fund flows doesn't seem to explain in these, data, the high return on anomaly portfolios, and conversely, low exposure doesn't seem to explain the lower returns. So, you know, I, I don't know entirely if this is the right type of regression to be looking at, given my questions about marginal uh, effects of different, you know, betas, but I think it would be useful for the authors to think more about this and to, um, in future work, consider what, what might be going on with these um, actual equity characteristic portfolios. All right, so two quick things on the model. So um, one could ask, what's the main purpose of the model? Um, all the theory results seem to be driven by the fee structure, which is proportional to asset under management. That in and of itself seems to raise a puzzle. Uh, why, why is this the fee structure? The model is not designed to explain the optimal fee structure as Liam had said. It, instead, it takes the given uh, fee structure the actual fee structure as given, I think that's fine. So, but then once we take the asset under management fee structure as given, why do we need the model? One could ask that the empirical investigation would naturally flow from a simple observation on fees. Well, presumably the authors would say, well, the, mo the model is useful to show how the empirical findings can be obtained in general equilibrium and to explain the pro-cyclical fund flows and counter-cyclical alpha 
Of course, then the specifics of the model matter. And so I just had two questions. And I, let me just preface this by saying that I am not an expert on funds. In fact, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be the first person or the second or the 10th to, to ask to discuss this paper for that reason. Um, you, I could think of a lot of people to discuss beforehand. So with that in mind, um, let me just ask question one, what about the body of evidence that has been raised by, um, you know, uh, by in a couple of times already previously today on uh, showing poor performance of the industry as a whole. You know, there are studies on this, actively manage funds, um, provide investors with a lower return than passive benchmarks. Um, the, in the paper, there's not much discussion of this. The model presumes that the actively managed mutual funds in aggregate provide value to clients. They cite Burke and Green. You know, I, my understanding is that they focus on the cross-section of funds, those with good track records grow, those with bad track records shrink. Um, this is more about the aggregate. The aggregate track record is poor. And so how in the model to account for this? Um, I guess you could lean really heavily on the, the so-called non-pecuniary utility benefit of active management. Um, you know, then there's just a question of what, what is that black box really there for? And so, that's a question. Um, and this, my last question is, is this, I think it's more about semantics and, and this possibly doesn't matter at all. So I want, this is, you know, but I got sidetracked trying to understand the various pieces of the payout to clients here and just trying to understand why the value added piece was proportional to asset under management. Um, and I think this is more a matter of semantics of what's in these different pieces and how to interpret them. The decreasing returns is, all you know that we know exists, um, or that we seem to think exists, is captured here. Um, you know, and so our, should we think about decreasing returns coming entirely as a result of these convex adjustment costs, or you know, otherwise without it under this specification, we'd have increasing returns to scale due to the specification of value added. You know, a pastor and Stambaugh say, well, decreasing returns at the industry level are caused by um, more funds chasing the same opportunities to outperform, so prices are affected. But I simply couldn't understand whether that would be better modeled as um, with value added and a constant alpha, say, um, you know, value added being a constant here or value added even decreasing itself in AUM along with the convex adjustment costs. This quite possibly doesn't matter for anything, but when you're thinking about this model and what these various pieces are, it, you know, it'd be nice to have some more precise interpretation and know what role this plays. If any, I mean, at the end of the day, you're left with, um, when you divide through by uh, assets under management, a constant here that's additive and does that matter uh, as opposed to some other way of, of modeling <clears throat> the, the sum of these two. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Bottom line, intriguing results. I think this paper makes contributions to our understanding of funds, at least um, what I could glean from my skimming of the literature as in my work on this paper, uh, thinking about this paper. And I think their findings are pointing to fruitful future work. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Sydney, for a great discussion. Um, we'll go straight to some questions. Some of this has been partially uh, discussed in the chat, but I think it's useful to uh, um, to revisit. So the first comment is uh, or question is from uh, John Campbell at Harvard. Hey, John. Oh, hi. Um, whoops. Uh, not sure how to get my picture up, but uh, we see a picture. Please. You do. Okay. Oh, good. All right. You see me. All right. <laughs> I can't see me. But um, I was just um, in the chat uh, bringing up an old paper by uh, Jason Karcheski, which came out in the JFQA in 2002. And he talks about mutual funds and their incentives to invest. But what he focuses on is, is the interaction between the aggregate fund flow and the particular funds that get, get inflows. And his, his, his story is based on the idea that there are big inflows when, uh, when the market does well, and then much smaller outflows when the market does badly. That's point one. And then point two is that the best performing funds are the ones that get the inflow. So then his, his story is that fund managers have the incentive to be top performing in a bull market. And the way you do that, of course, is you buy high beta stocks, high market beta stocks. And um, then he uses that to explain the low beta premium, the overpricing of high beta stocks. 
So it seems to me that effect could easily be incorporated in your model. And in fact, you find that uh, mutual funds do tilt towards high beta stocks. And then in your interesting natural experiment with the natural disasters, it looks as if the disaster uh, causes that tilt to increase, which uh, might be consistent with this story. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how to incorporate that aspect of things. Uh, in other words, where do the flows go? Which funds get the flows? That seems to be important. Yeah, so uh, there are multiple points here. Uh, I think that uh, it's fair to say that we didn't try to explain why market beta uh, has uh, any predictive ability because uh, that is a separate uh, story. And the, the one that you described in John maybe actually what is going on. Uh, one could incorporate into the model, but it's basically adding another target essential for the model uh, with uh, an additional ingredient. As far as thinking that uh, fund flows go into different funds, uh, that essentially it would basically say that different funds have different betas on the aggregate flows. And uh, one uh, way to do that is to just say agnostic without trying to understand why some funds or even which funds have high or low betas, one can just control for the fund characteristics to look at the time variation in uh, uh, fund behavior. So you could control for the betas of different funds being different. Um, but uh, we did look at uh, some fund characteristics related to fund age, size. So it does appear that these characteristics uh, predict the exposure of uh, fund flows to aggregate flows. But again, that wasn't our uh, target to really understand um, where exactly uh, money goes in terms of how different funds load uh, on the aggregate flows. Uh, for our purposes, it's sufficient that on average they have positive loading, but that's a dimension of heterogeneity that one could uh, also use. So that's absolutely right. I mean, there is a counter argument. You see, if you go down this route, it's very, it's very easy to criticize it by saying that, yes, you're telling me that funds have different betas and aggregate flows, and therefore they behave differently. But this is a cross-sectional regression. Isn't the beta on the aggregate flows endogenous? And uh, therefore, whatever you're doing from here on is really a suspect. So it cuts both ways. But in terms of understanding the structure of the data, I think it's, it's a valid uh, direction to pursue as well. Great, uh, thank you, Leonid. Um, we'll go to the next question uh, from also from the chat, but it's useful to take it live here, which is from Neil Stoughton at the University of Arizona. Uh, Neil, please go ahead when you're ready. Thanks for taking my uh, question. Yeah, just uh, you know, this is just a question about the um, the assumption that there is risk aversion with respect to these fund flows. You know, in some of the work that I've uh, done and and others you see this convexity and, uh, you know, in order to, uh, you know, convexity, especially with respect to ranks of performance. And if you think about it, uh, you know, when there's convexity to payoffs of managers, there's going to be a, um, you know, the only way you're going to reach there is by taking risk. If you don't take uh, risk, especially with respect to idiosyncratic risk, you're not going to reach the, the top decile or, or a demi decile or whatever performance where the payoff is found. So that seems to go against the story in the model about risk aversion with respect to fund flows, as far as I could tell. I would say that uh, these two are not inconsistent. Um, essentially, we're talking about different pieces of the flows. This uh, story that uh, there is a convex relation between fund flows and uh, between fund flows and idiosyncratic component performance. That would explain the idiosyncratic component of flows. And that would suggest that unless risk aversion kills this effect, they may actually behave as a risk-seeking risk agents in the direction of idiosyncratic flows. But what we're looking at are systematic flows. These are the flows that are beyond their control, right? They don't uh, affect them with their own idiosyncratic performance. And so there, if they are risk averse to begin with, that risk aversion is going to remain in their behavior. So I would say that these are perfectly consistent with each other. Now, we don't uh, look at uh, what behavior the idiosyncratic piece induces. Uh, 
that would essentially boil down to hedging your own idiosyncratic performance. So that does affect your portfolio, but it wouldn't lead to pricing of aggregate shocks. It would essentially just change their incentives. Are they risk averse or risk loving when they choose their portfolio? But as far as the aggregate shocks, again, they would be still risk averse with respect to those given their underlying risk aversion to begin with. Because that's gonna be absorbed in the relative performance, in the relative piece. So, so on the surface, this doesn't strike me as inconsistent uh, at all. It could add another dimension to this, but it will be kind of orthogonal to pricing of aggregate shocks. All right, thank you, Linid. Uh, let's do one more question and then uh, let's start wrapping up. So the next question is from uh, Rob Stambaugh uh, from Wharton. Rob, go ahead. Yeah, I was sort of, uh, curious about what this direct utility to delegate, how big a role that's playing. It seems like in the absence of that, There'd be no reason for investors to delegate to, to delegate money to active managers. It seems like in your model, the active managers would be generating negative gross alpha. You know, for example, in your theorem two, it says they hold the market portfolio plus this hedge portfolio, which I think that would have a negative alpha, the hedge portfolio of negative alpha, because it's you know tilting toward the, the lower expected return stocks away from the higher ones. So, so it seems like the, the, these active managers you have in your model. Are generating negative gross alpha, and uh, so and just it seems like the way you get investors to invest in in actively managed funds is the direct utility through delegation. So I mean, does your model predict a negative alpha? In other words, is your is your model sort of one story for why we get negative alpha on mutual funds? Or I mean, what what I'm trying to figure out what's going on there. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Rob. So basically. Uh... I wouldn't say predict because it's pretty hardwired uh, at the end of the day, uh, right? Once you have this utility from delegation, it's really easy to get a negative alpha. Uh, negative alpha would be a puzzle. It's like, why do you get a negative alpha, right? So you need a piece and uh, we do it in reduced form. So that's fine. But uh, there is one piece that you're leaving out here, which is that we do assume that these active managers, they do have a gross alpha that they're creating that do add value at the expense of direct investors. So they lose value because they're hedging, but they do add value to begin with, which means that if we get rid of the money doctor's effect, if we get rid of this utility of delegation, what would happen is that the amount of funds delegated would be determined in equilibrium. So on the margin, investors would be indifferent between managing directly and uh, basically doing uh, just forming their own portfolio and then losing this transfer to the active managers or delegating and then losing something uh, on the hedge, right, that these managers do, but then gaining that uh, alpha. So, so in equilibrium, they they'll be indifferent. And sorry, how, how are they getting positive alpha by holding the market plus this hedge portfolio? This, I mean, your your theorem that says they're the active managing portfolio is the market plus the hedge portfolio. So, so how does that generate positive gross alpha? Uh, it's a reduced form assumption that the, the managers are able to extract value uh, directly from the direct investors. It's not computed. But the direct investors are holding the mean variance efficient portfolio. So they can't have a negative alpha. I mean, the alphas have to add up across these three parties to zero, right? I mean, the weighted average alpha. So, uh, so the direct investors are holding the mean variance efficient portfolio. So they have, they have a positive alpha with respect to the market. It seems like the active managers are generating negative gross alpha with respect to the market. But, but you've got people nevertheless investing with them because the, there's this direct utility for delegation. It seems like that's your model. Right, so the alphas, they do add up to zero because there is this negative piece that direct investors are facing and it's a transfer to the active managers. Uh, for better or worse, we don't model exactly how that uh, uh, aggregates from the individual security selection. As I said, it's a reduced form assumption, which, uh, it is what it is. You could imagine multiple stories that could uh, support this kind of transfer that active managers are able to do better than the passive direct investors. But if you want to microfound it, it would really complicate the model. Like for example, if you look at the uh, uh, information asymmetry models like Grossman Stiglitz, you could easily get uh, informed uh, investors doing better than the rational uninformed. So there is a transfer there. But if you go down that road, then you need to rewrite the whole model with that ingredient. Uh, you could uh, say that, well, if I don't want to delegate, I'm just going to hold an index fund, but then the index fund is going to follow the index. 
and by being slave to the index, they may give up some uh, uh, value by essentially demanding uh, immediacy. Whenever they trade, they want to follow the index. So someone who is able to deviate can provide liquidity to the index funds do a little bit better. So that's a very different story with frictions. Again, to incorporate that into the model, it would be really complicate it. So it's a brute force device. One could say it may be aesthetically jarring, but it is what it is. It's a transfer to the funds and uh, it just gives an incentive to the, um, these um, fund clients to delegate. The reality is one could kill it. They would still delegate because of this uh, utility thing. But since you ask what would happen when you switch off the utility piece in equilibrium, there would be a point of indifference uh, where they can either manage directly or delegate and face this kind of um, eroded performance due to the hedge. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that the alpha in equilibrium has to be negative. Uh, it's gonna be determined basically by this indifference condition. And what we get really from this uh, utility piece is that we don't need to solve for that interior point where investors are indifferent between delegating or not. We're always at the corner where they delegate all of their assets to the funds. So that uh, is uh, the benefit of that assumption. But again, if I really are interested in why the net alpha will be negative in equilibrium, this is not an explanation. There is an ingredient that gives you that, which is that they're getting utility from delegating. So despite of the negative equilibrium alpha, they would still do it. 